Like, I'm not, I've never been on national TV. I haven't done a late night spot. I haven't been on a sitcom. So I don't have, you know, a national, anything that's made me, given me national exposure. Um, I've had a decent career so far, I would say. I mean, I'm by no means am I what I consider myself a successful comedian, a successful comedian, but I do work hard. The thing about comedy is that it's in our own hands. Like, nobody else, you do need to rely on opportunities along the way to keep getting more success, but you, it's just you. You're fully responsible. When you go up on stage, nobody but you will be able to, do, to be funny or not be funny. Obviously, an audience will judge you, and they're the ultimate deciding factor whether you're funny or not, but everything else is in your control. You write your own material, you're on stage by yourself, it's just you, a microphone, a stool, and a dark room, and you're on a stage trying to make these strangers laugh. I'm gonna start rolling here. Okay. And so whenever you guys are ready, I'm just gonna sync the two cameras quick. Yep. Dan, can you please uh, tell us your name, introduce yourself and your occupation? Well, my name is Dan Bublitz Jr. I am a, uh, let's, let's cut that and start over. Cause I forgot. I gotta. I gotta. I gotta include them questions in with my answers. Who are you and what do you do? No, oh, I got that. Okay. There we go. My name is Dan Bublitz Jr. and as a profession, I am a professional stand-up comedian, host of a podcast, producer. Sometimes I'm a director. Sometimes I'm a writer. Uh, overall, I'm just a struggling independent artist. I've been doing stand-up comedy for almost 11 years now, and I got into stand-up comedy because I got divorced. So stand-up comedy was something I always wanted to do. I didn't do it because I grew up in the Midwest where we're raised to not follow our dreams. Uh, I did come here from a state, a state of depression to be here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm at Sisyphus Brewery for the Sisyphus in the, in the Sisyphus Comedy Room. I just took part in a theme show called the Punch Out Punchline, where you're given a topic and you're given 24 hours to write a new five minutes on that said topic. My topic was state. It was hard to do. Uh, I was nervous about it. I feel like my jokes went over really well, a lot better than I anticipated. I honestly thought they were going to be crap because I wrote them at 4 o'clock this afternoon. I did a lot better than I anticipated. I was very depressed about this word. Uh, when I was trying to figure out what I was going to write, all I could think to do was to do uh, headlines from the United States. <laughs> yeah, uh, AKA a roast of America. Because <laughs> if we've seen the headlines, oh my God, they're crazy, you know? Because America, the United States is the best country in the world. <laughs> if you ask certain people. <laughs> We're raised to either go to college or get a job, get married, have children, you know, or buy houses, have car payments, all the, you know, the American dream, if you will. And so I didn't pursue anything that I wanted to do when I was younger. I was, I got married. I was 19 when I got married and we were married for 12 years and then we got divorced and I decided that I had a moment after the divorce where I was kind of struggling because my life had changed uh, drastically. I went from being, you know, married life to just single and just everything about my life was different. And uh, I remember there was a moment when I was just looking in the mirror in the bathroom and I know it's cliche, but I was just like looking in the mirror and at that moment I just decided I didn't want to be a person, I didn't want to be an older person that looked back at my life and wondered what if. 
I wanted to know the outcome. And at that moment, I decided I was going to try things. And whether I succeeded or failed, I'd know the outcome. And so stand-up was one of the main things that I wanted to do. I don't know if anybody here uses cannabis. I know it's not legal here. I'm not narking on anybody. Don't worry, I'm not a cop. Uh, see, I told you guys, now you can trust me. Those are the rules. <laughs> can't, can't vouch for anybody else in the audience, but again, I don't know if anybody uses cannabis, but if you do and you want to get it for free, I got a life hack for you. Befriend a pothead and tell them that you don't smoke weed. They will make it their lifelong mission to convert you to the green side. <laughs> I re and I remember when they called my name, you know, I remember the host going up there and calling my name and as they called my name and I was walking up to the stage, I grabbed the microphone and I looked out in the audience and I immediately thought, oh my God, what did I get myself into? Because I also have a big fear of public speaking. So I also had to overcome stage fright. And yeah, at that moment I was just like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And then I opened my mouth and said my first joke, got a couple little giggles, a couple little laughs, then I said another joke, got another laugh. And then I was like, yep, this is what I'm gonna do. This is my, this is what I'm gonna pursue now. After I got that, that laugh, I was immediately hooked. Next week, I'm gonna be recording an album in my basement. I'm converting my basement into a showroom. I've, truth be told, I have recorded a comedy album. I've recorded like five or six uh previous times and i didn't like how the recordings turned out there was just various reasons one of the most recent recordings i decided i thought oh i had this bright idea i will go and i will do an album recording in my hometown what could go wrong i'm in my hometown all the people that uh that knew me will come out to the show and it'll be grand and great and it'll be amazing and you'll get that hometown support and most of that was true however uh my my eighth grade algebra teacher showed up and she was a little liquored up and um she started heckling. She was kind of heckling through the whole show, and her party was kind of being disruptive. Um, and she heckled through other comics, and they tried to tell her, "Hey, you gotta, you know, be whatever." And then, uh, then when I went up, she heckled me too. Uh, I don't understand the bet channel. You ready for this? Does anybody have any duct tape? We might need it. All right, we're gonna try. We're, we're gonna try this again. We're, we got like five minutes worth of jokes. Can we do this. All right, we're gonna do it. Well, I'm gonna say it again. Just be quiet and listen. You listen with your ears, not your mouth. I'm not gonna lie. This 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 kind of feels good though. I'm not gonna lie, guys. This is like poetic justice. I'm scolding a teacher. You have no idea how good this feels. Exactly. Now shut the fuck up. <laughs> That's why I want to do the recording in my basement because now I have more control. I know who's going to, you know, I don't know everybody that's going to be there, but it's going to be people. They got to be vetted in the sense where it's friends of friends, you know, trying to be safe, especially right now. We're going, you know, there's a pandemic. And the purpose of my basement show is to put out, hopefully, put out an album and to create more content to put out there. I mean, as an artist, you're not gonna, you gotta have content to put out on the, the interwebs, and that's what this is, more content to get my name out there. Yeah, so this is where I'm gonna do the show. I gotta take all of this space, and I'm gonna turn it into a showroom. I've got the stage already here, but I'm gonna have a backdrop. I'm gonna put in lights, all them chairs over there will be out here, and when it's all done, it's gonna look like a comedy club. And I'm going to record my album in here because I have all the control. Friday and Saturday, August 27th and 28th, I am recording my comedy album, Strangers in My Basement. That's because uh, we're going to be recording in my basement with a room full of strangers. Here's what the room looks like. This is how it is set up. you got the nice little stage. There's lots of seating. 
uh, but it's limited seating. The seating is very limited, and tickets are free. There's a handful of tickets left for both shows. You just need to go to blitzedentertainment.com to reserve those free tickets, and then that way you can get the address of the venue. Both shows are going to be great. You can make a living as a comic, but it's not its not as easy to do it solely off stand-up comedy. You have to find other uh, avenues of revenue, other resources to, to make, you know. That's why so many stand-up comedians take writing jobs, or they'll do, you know, acting, and they'll do voiceovers and things like that, and a lot, and a lot of people do podcasts. That's something I do. It doesn't bring in a lot of revenue for me, but it's also a creative outlet for me. I have a lot of tattoos. It's something I've been doing over the years, but uh, I don't just get tattoos without having special meaning. All my tattoos have some sort of a meaning. I have a tattoo on my wrist that I just got like during the tour that says, Be present, smile, have fun. That is a reminder when I'm on stage to do those things. That's why it's on the, the arm where I hold my microphone. This tattoo is a tattoo of a wizard. It looks like a uh, kind of childish if you will but it was it's actually a memorial to my mom she drew this for me when i was a kid and she was in jail uh she had sent that to me so it has a lot of special meaning to me this tattoo i just got to tat this in vegas a few months ago and that's the only purpose it, it's got a couple purposes it's kind of a reminder of a trip i took with my fiance and I wanted to get a cool tattoo while I was in Vegas, so it hit two birds, one stone. And then I have some text on my arm that uh, is a quote that says, uh, Love conquers, hate consumes, love more, hate less. Uh, because you gotta be, you got to be full of love and not full of hate. You know, I have my podcast, The Art of Bombing, which not, not only has it been a good creative outlet it's helped me as a comic just by doing this podcast and talking to other performers about failure and dealing with you know kind of the the mental health that goes around with that of you know feeling like a failure the imposter syndrome things like that it's helped me grow as a comedian and as a person because i've learned so much from other performers you know like the the biggest lesson i learned was i'm not alone so do you think anyone's going to come to this basement show you're doing I sure hope so. It's time for the show. It's time for the show. It's time for the show with Dan Bobas Jr. everybody your headliner on the evening he is having his dry bar comedy special release this fall give it up for Dan Bublitz everybody When people find out that I'm a comedian, it usually goes one of two ways. It's either, tell me a joke, or you don't seem that funny. I get that quite a bit too. And it, that's always funny, because that, that's the kind of reaction uh, I usually get like right before a show. Because people just assume comics are always on. Like, if you're a comedian, uh, then you're obviously, you're just a clown. And that's all you do all day is you just go run around all day and you're just handing out jokes to people. You're just like, here, here's a joke for you. Here's a joke for you. Jokey, jokey, joke. But we're not. We're human. We're people. And other people forget that. And so a lot of times, like before a show, I might be sitting at a bar and just having, sitting at the bar, having a drink, just relaxing, getting my mind, you know, getting in the mood or getting ready to, to, you know, prepared to perform, I'm not going to be fine. I'm not going to be on. I'm not going to be cracking jokes because I'm trying to concentrate on my job. You know, that's stand-up comedy when I'm performing at a venue and being paid. It is my job and I want to be as professional and as good as I possibly can. Another, like I said, another response is always, tell me a joke. I will go sit down. <laughs> in fact, in my entire life, I've actually only been in one physical altercation. It was with my father when I was 12. He roundhouse kicked me in the face. 
Now, before you judge my father, you should know he was showing me how to do the roundhouse kick, <laughs> and I walked into his foot. <laughs> Which, when people do that, I always try to respond with, buy a ticket, come to a show. I mean, if you want to see me tell jokes, it's like, I don't come, you know, I don't come when you're on your day off and ask you to, you know, fix my car. If you're a mechanic or if you're a doctor, I don't find you on the golf course and be like, hey man, I, I think I broke my, my ankle. Can you cast me up here? A lot of times when people find out you do stand-up comedy, they just assume uh, on the weekends, Friday and Saturday, you show up to a venue, you do maybe two shows a night, but you're performing an hour. So they're thinking, oh, you're making all that money and you're only working four hours a week. Well, for one, it's not all that much money when you break it down and put in all the hours that it takes to get to that performance because there's a lot that goes into getting to that performance. You have to, you have to get booked on that show. You have to write that material. You have to edit material. You have to uh, plan for travel. You can't just decide you're going to do a show and then just magically go do the show. You have to, and you have to plan for, can try to plan for the unexpected. And this is my room for tonight in Aberdeen. I'm actually staying at a friend's house. They're out of town this weekend and offered their place, so I decided to take them up on the offer. So I don't need to pay for a campground tonight, so I'm not going to camp like I thought I was going to. And I did this because... I wanted to save a little bit of money because uh, I lost money on my show in Keystone because it was a door deal and not very many people were at the show. I had to pay for gas to get there. I had to pay for my campsite. So I didn't make money on it, but I got to perform and I'm work out my hour. So that's the positive of it. Part of that planning and being ready to be on the road, you have to, there's maintenance on your car, you know, People don't think of that as part of the job, but it is. You know, booking hotels if it doesn't come included, finding your lodging, you know, just all the, there's a lot of planning and preparation. And then on top of all that, just the planning and preparation to go do gigs and work on the road, you have to maintain a social presence because we're in the age of social media and a lot of, you know, industry people, they're looking for entertainers that have a good social media presence and a good following. And so on top of, you know, going and performing, now I got to edit videos to try to put on my social media. I got to try to be creative with what I'm putting on there to be interesting. Because if I'm not interesting, people aren't going to want to follow me. And that's something I struggle with all the time. I'm like, I don't know if I'm interesting. I try to be, but and if I don't make any money, well, then I have to choose a different profession, <laughs> and and I don't want that. So <laughs> I didn't have an interesting uh, interesting upbringing because I was born and raised in the South, woo, woo! South Dakota, <laughs> which is uh, it was it's basically Arkansas of the Dakotas. <laughs> Yeah, and I never fit in growing up in South Dakota. I didn't fit in with my friends. I didn't fit in really with my family, you know, because everybody in South Dakota, they just run around all the time. They're like, beer, guns, look at my penis. And I was like, Mom, put your clothes back on. <laughs> Working a gig like this, like you said, they don't pay very good. A lot of comedy gigs don't pay very good unless you are a draw and a big name celebrity. And comedy is one of the few industries where you, where the, the, the pay hasn't really increased in the last 25, 30 years. Like it's kind of, for a lot of these road gigs, it's kind of the same. Uh, and it has been the same, you know, as a feature, you, you know, typical pay for a feature can range anywhere from 100 to $150. A headliner might make two to $300. An MC, they might make 25 to 50 a show. And then clubs, they do it a little different because the, the nice thing when you get booked at a club, you're, you know, unless it's a special event or something, you're most likely working there for the full week. Pay hasn't changed a lot. You know, you got to try to save money while you're on the road. Lodging is important. You know, when you, if you're trying to get into comedy when you're booking shows, you want to try to negotiate either extra pay for lodging or for the venues or whoever's booking you to provide lodging because it, it is important and a lot of people don't think about what 
lo- the, the importance of lodging in the sense of the money. You know, we don't we don't look at our expenses. People want to do comedy, and they just think, "Oh, I'm just going to go do comedy." They forget that it is a business, and in order to be a successful business, you need to profit. You need to make a profit. And if you're not cutting your expenses, you're not going to profit. Ultimately, you're not going to be a successful business. Uh, I've known comics who have been homeless. You know, they, like I had a, an apartment in San Diego, and at one time, I probably had two or three, or maybe even four other comics I knew crashing on my floor because they really couldn't afford their own places because they were, you know, they were grinding. They were being comedians. You make as many sacrifices as you need to, to, to pursue the dream. But one of the sacrifices that I made to do this is I gave up a corporate job, a good paying corporate job. I worked in material control and I was, I guess, kind of middle management, I guess. And it paid really well too at the time. You know, this was like 11 or 12 years ago and I was making $16 an hour then. And so I made good money and I decided I'm not happy. I'm going to go do what makes me happy, or at least try to go be happy. And I remember the conversation I had with my dad when I told him this, that I was like, hey, I'm going to go and move to California to pursue comedy. And, you know, he... He didn't have, like, a lot of reservations, but he he wanted, you know, be a father. And he was like, hey, I get what you're trying to do, but, you know, you should maybe put a little thought into it. I mean, you you get you make good money, you have insurance, you have all these benefits. Are you sure this is what you want to do? And, you know, I'm going to support you either way. And that's one thing I've been very fortunate. My father has been very supportive with the comedy career because I know he had to think I was crazy. I'm 32 years old and telling him I'm going to quit my regular job to go pursue a, a pipe dream, essentially. You know, it's like how many people actually make it in comedy or in anything they do. Uh, there's a lot of struggle, but I I just knew, like I said, from the moment when I got that first laugh, I was like, this is what I got to do. I got to go do this. And if I have to sleep in my car from time to time to be happy, so be it. I'd rather work, I'd rather go do the work that I want to do and live the life I want to do than be basically, uh, basically enslaved to a corporation and that doesn't care about you. All right, so we're, we are recording. Now, the first question, what is one hope for your son? Uh, that he succeeds and all he strives for and that he never gives up at his goals and that he outlives his dad. What's one fear you have for your son? That's hard. I really don't have any fears for my son. I, I, I have full confidence in him. In the end, are you proud of your son? Yes, always proud of all my children. Uh, what are your thoughts on your son pursuing stand-up comedy? Great, I love it. He's a funny man and he does well at what he does. Perfect. Good job. Chase your dream. Just do what I did. Quit your job, chase your dream, and then go back to school just in case it don't work out. Most people quit college just pursue stand-up comedy. I started stand-up comedy and that got me to go to college. There you have it. Friday, I'm going to graduate with my associates in applied science for business administration. And in addition to that degree, I actually have two marketing degrees. I have one that focuses on um, graphic design, and the other one is just a general marketing degree. Why do you keep doing this? It's hard. I'm hmm, I'm hooked on pers. Oh, that sounds clunky when I say it that way. Oh. I'm pursuing stand-up comedy because it's the only thing I've ever felt like I was good at. Success in comedy isn't about being famous. It's, I mean, really success in anything is about doing whatever you want. And that's with comedy. You can, there are plenty of comics that live comfortably by being unknown comics. And, you know, right now I'm an unknown comic. Would I like to be a famous comic? Who wouldn't? We're, that's why we're all doing it. But at the end of the day, 
I still get to do what I want. I still get to live life by my terms. I don't report to a boss. I don't, I don't have to go to a job. I, you know, and down the road, these things could change, but it's still in my control. And at the end of the day, that's what I want. If I don't succeed, it's because I didn't work hard enough. But as long as I'm putting in the work, I'm going to succeed. I might not get famous, but I'm going to be a working comic. Yeah, you know, when you get older, you have to take risks. Oh. <laughs> Getting heckled by the police. <laughs> it's funny because, uh, yeah, you can't control everything. It's funny because earlier my I, my cat kept coming in here. I, I I'm sorry if people don't like cats if he's bothering you. Uh, but it's funny because my cat's now keeps coming down here to try to steal the show. Uh, and he's probably like coming down here. He's like, why are there so many strangers in my bathroom? <laughs> Well, hello, Hugo. It's literally, this is the only venue where I can get heckled by a cat. It's not comedy. I, I was like, you know what? I got heckled by my eighth grade algebra teacher during a recording one time. That's why I didn't release it, and now I'm getting heckled by my cat. I was like, I'm going to do this in my basement where it's controlled. Turns out he can jump over gates. <laughs> I want to ask, are you happy? Am I happy? That'd be funny if I just like blanked out. <laughs> just like, what? what kind of question is that? Am I happy? Absolutely. I'm following my dream. Uh, so hey, let's be excited. Like, yeah. yeah. Let's not be excited. Let's now. just be. Let's just be real. God damn it! None of this fake bullshit. More professional. God damn it, I'm a professional. That's for the outtakes. That can be that the closing credits. God damn it, I'm a professional. Okay. Um, Just make sure. sure. I'm liking the responses. It's good. I'm not. This is okay. trash. It, it probably it's is. Throwing I'm everything. Still, I'm like, why are you guys fucking doing a documentary about me? One. <laughs> and I think that's you're the Don Quixote of Minneapolis comedy. You know why it is? Because I'm a goddamn professional. <laughs> That's for the outtakes. That can be that the closing credits. God damn it, I'm a professional. Okay. Uh,